Welcome to this week's episode of the Evolve to Succeed podcast. This week's guests are joint managing directors, Jess and Terry of Rubicon People. They're coming onto the podcast to tell a little bit about their own story and journey with the business. That transition from being entrepreneurial and owner managed to being employee owned and also their recent appointment as joint managing directors and how they're making that work. So there's loads to hear in this conversation, I am sure. There'll be lessons galore and something for us all to take away. I really hope you're enjoying the Evolved Succeed podcast. And if so, please do rate, subscribe to the podcast and help us. But for now, let's get on with the show. Welcome, Jess. Welcome, Terry, Thank to you. the Evolved to Succeed podcast. Thanks, Warren. Got another double act on as guests <laughs> yeah. on this podcast. Going to be talking about your story, your journey with Rubicon. Really going to feature there on this transition to an employee ownership trust business. And congratulations on your joint appointment as managing director. So we're going to talk about that transition. And that's what the focus of the conversation is going to be about. Okay. But how long have you both been at Rubicon, how when does the story start for you both? Um, for me, it was the seventeenth of October, two thousand and five. So it was uh, my twentieth birthday. Look at um, that! You've aged yourself from yeah. injury, Jess. <laughs> when I got the contract from Lloyd, and it said the seventeenth of October, I thought I can't start a new job on my birthday, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> uh, okay, and for you. I was the following year, so I was uh, late summer, I was August um, of the year after. So by that point, Jess had got in, got the ball rolling, bedded everything in. It was a, uh, yeah, so a, a, a long time, 19 years now. So Wow. So yeah. I had hair when I started, which yeah. is pretty cool. I would have had hair when I, I started. Know, well, yeah. I'd like to say that, I probably didn't. Yeah, absolutely. So you've both been with the business a long time. Did you envisage that you would have been with the business that long? Particularly you, maybe, Jess, <laughs> joining at age 20. Mm, well, Terry was 20 as well. I know he uh, looks a bit older than me, but yeah. Marginally. Yeah, <laughs> we're the same age. Actually, no, you've just turned 39. I'm 39 next that. month. Yeah, okay. But no, um, no, I don't think I quite knew what I wanted to do. I was actually due to start in the September before I started at Rubicon in the October. I was due to go to university right. to study PR in London and follow in my mother's footsteps. I just wanted to go out and earn money and so popped into Rubicon to find myself a job yeah. and found myself in an interview um, and was offered there and then. And yeah, I don't know where the time's gone. Wow, brilliant. And you, Terry? Yeah, much the same. I mean, we're, we're, we're both from a catering and hospitality background. And I don't think anyone typically leaves school and thinks, you know what, I really want a career in recruitment. But <laughs> looking at the skills that we had picked up through catering um, and, and retail, it was you're, you're, you're dealing with people, it's constant communication, you're dealing with different pressured environments, you're, yeah, so we, we both kind hours. of yeah. fell, into, uh, <laughs> fell into recruitment, not thinking it would be forever, but happy that uh, that we've been here for nearly two decades yeah, so, yeah. and here we are here we are <laughs> and what was the business like back then entirely different entirely different everything from the building that the business was operating out of to the clients that we had i remember the day when we deployed our 40th temp in right. a consecutive week which was which was monumental um for us but but uh, a small slither of what we're kind of putting out nowadays. Right. But the industries as well, they've changed in their entirety. We have mo multiple branches then. So Terry was actually based on Parkstone Road in Paul, and I was yeah. based on Commercial Road, just down from the Job yeah. Centre in Bournemouth. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was back in the days of fax. It was crazy. Yeah. used to hear the fax uh, tone and go and stand yeah. by it and think oh gosh who's faxing us with a a new booking and um it was one of the solicitors often and yeah it was just so so different back then yeah it was long before the days of even the internet so so or when you, you didn't have indeed on monster or anything like this yeah. you would put an advert in the echo and patiently look at the phone on a Thursday, waiting for it to waiting ring for, for people for to, people to apply for a job. <laughs> yeah, And that was the best source of leads as well, to find our new clients was yeah. looking yeah. in the Echo on a Thursday. Who's yeah, who's Basically, working it. in recruitment was all about Thursdays. Wow. Yeah. 
<laughs> Couldn't take Thursdays yeah. off. Yeah. In those two decades, how uh, the world, the has, world changed has changed and the recruitment agency has changed. But at the time, the business had two co-owners, didn't it? Laurie yep, absolutely. and Jocelyn, who really did play pivotal roles. They had acquired the business. They yeah. were driving growth through the business. You know, how would you describe their leadership style at the time? I mean, what was the business like from a dynamic perspective at that time? I mean, Lloyd was the face. Um, yeah. He was the person who was completely associated with the brand. Um, Jocelyn was behind the scenes. Mm. Um, it was almost like, you know, the brains yeah. and the brawn. It was... It, it, they were a brilliant duo. Um, Jocelyn was actually really hands-on back in those days. Incredibly hands-on, yeah. Um, whereas Lloyd was out constantly networking. He had the employers' forum. Yeah. The six um, of the best. Yeah. He, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, he, he was always out doing the business development. But they, he was never a recruiter. He, he ran the business. He was the face of it. He did the marketing, the sales, yeah. the growth. But he never was hands-on operational. Um, he, I think more so than Terry, he took me under his wing a lot from that kind of uh, brand face of oh, okay. the business. Yeah. Um, I started going to the employers forums with him um, and he used to get me presenting. I mean, I was in my early 20s and I'd be presenting to a room full of, you know, 70 odd business owners yeah. and HR professionals who knew so much more than I did, um, but he gave me that opportunity. Um, in fact, I was actually terrified of speaking publicly. I loved building relationships. That was what I've always loved, but actually speaking to a room full of people who were, you know, more often than not a lot older than me, but also a hell of a lot wiser than me um, was terrifying. And I remember he just, yeah, he, he just unclipped my wings and just, just pushed me, a, pushed me. A, completely yeah. into the deep end. Yeah, exactly. And do you have similar memories like that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I was, and it, it, it's kind of worked out similar to how it is now with Jess being the more outwardly facing yeah. and, and me being more internal. But I worked very closely with JB Joslin yeah. Um, focused on the process behind things and at the at the time we were bringing on lots of big accounts that needed setting up in all sorts of different all sorts of different ways um, and the industries that we were working within were very different as well but but they, it was um yeah it, it, it Lloyd and JB Joslyn chalk and cheese um, but actually as a duo the yeah. perfect the perfect partnership Perfect they made it work, didn't they? Probably. They really did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. JB went out and built a, a bespoke database for us as well. So our earliest memories of recruitment were using something that had been kind of hashed together using all sorts of Microsoft different Access bits of software. And, um, and that was where JB's strength really came into it. Mm. She, she had worked within recruitment, I think, for sort of 25 years previously. So she had all this knowledge that she was able to bring to to the mini little Rubicon and, and help us help us grow. Help fuel the growth and Indeed. all of those yeah. kind of things. And what do you think were made, because they were a strong partnership, weren't they? Mm. And, and you must look at them as a new partnership leading the business now for the things you could learn from them. So what do you, when you look at that partnership that was so successful between them, what lessons do you take from that? This is something we've looked at quite closely, actually. Um, and... I think for, for me, probably the most important factor is each having ownership and accountability of particular areas of the business. And if that's something that Jess is looking after, that's something that Jess is looking after. And it's ensuring that you're not muddling and yeah. that each of you have your own, your own areas of responsibility. And that's something that Lloyd and JB had, um, had in place from the, uh, from the onset. Yeah. And trust as well. Um, I think that's really important to know that the areas that we have agreed on um, to be accountable for, that I'll know that Terry is on top of those yeah. and he'll know that I'm on top of you're them. Do what and you're we, you do. know, we, yeah. we don't expect to always agree. Um, there's always going to be different viewpoints, different ways of thinking about things. Um, but if we always had the same view, there'd be one of us too many doing mm. this job. Yeah, absolutely. 
It's interesting, isn't it? That, that, you know, this piece around you now being joint MDs, and we'll talk about how that transition came about yeah. and the employee ownership trust, but you're now really are starting to replicate that success that Jocelyn and Lloyd had, didn't you? Mm. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we are. And we're, we're trying to do that whilst ensuring that we're keeping up to speed with the, the changing industry and yeah. everything else, which is... Um, and do you think if you hadn't seen it work in the past, you'd be able to do what you're doing now in terms of being joint managing directors? I think I, I was probably a little bit more sceptical about it because Lloyd and Jocelyn weren't joint managing directors. No. Lloyd was managing Absolutely, director. Yeah, yeah. Jocelyn, um, the title was commercial director or director, but they were both founders. Yeah. Um, but Lloyd assumed that MD role. And I've seen it not work on a couple of occasions mm. from um, businesses that we've yeah. recruited for. So, you know, both both having that role, I, I suppose I was lit, maybe last year when it was first spoken about, uh, little bit more skeptical at first um but then the more we spoke about it towards the end of last year and realized that you know actually and whilst we are co-mds it couldn't be done without the leadership team that Mm. we've put you know we've put in that have since kind of elevated um to steer the ship i mean lloyd he had a lot of responsibilities across the business, but the difference is, is Lloyd was never operational. Terry and I have both come from mm. very much functional director roles. Yeah. So it's, it is very similar, but there are also key differences as well. Brilliant. And you don't know what you don't know mm. yeah. in the early days, which is sort of what we really, really found. And, and as we learn more about what we don't know and what we need to be doing, that's where the partnership really comes into its own mm-hmm. because you're able to to divvy up things as they as they best lie. Yeah. So And so Jess has been honest enough to say she was slightly skeptical about how it could work when it was first muted. What were your feelings, Terry? So I I um it's similar ish. But I was quite open from the onset with regards to that I wouldn't have wanted to do the MD role on my own, actually. So we've we've both got different different motivators. And um, the way that we went about becoming co-MD probably wasn't the norm. Um, But actually, if we were a company that was turning over two million pound a year and there was six or seven operators out there, it may have been a different story. But but that's not Rubicon. We're yeah. we're a sizable business. We've we've got a lot of people that that depend on the direction and the steer from the leadership team, mm. um, and that's something that I was reluctant to take on in its entirety. But with a partner in crime, it's uh, it's going swimmingly. Brilliant, fantastic. And if you look over the twenty years, just think about you know what are some of the challenges you know that you've faced in the business. And how have you overcome some of those? That's sort of like the journey yeah. to date, more. So many. Where do you Gosh. start? This is why I have no hair. It's. it's um, <laughs> I mean, one one that was, I, I think, a pretty obvious one that that affected the whole of the UK was COVID. Yeah. And when you're deploying, you know, several hundred people on a daily basis, and all of a sudden you're not allowed to leave your home, but you've got particular industries that you're supplying into that are. Um, key workers for the NHS that that that's a big thing to to kind of try and overcome and lots of the the legislation that was created around employment wasn't favorable towards working remotely no. even things down to the validating of identification and the all sorts so so for me covid was a was a massive a massive eye opener to to what could be done in a different manner and we came out of covid very uh, very strongly and it's it's been fundamental in the direction that the business has taken over the last the last couple of years yeah we had really good leadership you know lloyd was still very much at the helm through that pandemic yeah. and it was it was horrible never want to repeat no, it again but i think lloyd's you know police and military backgrounds was like you know it it was brilliant leadership style yeah. that he adopted over over that yeah. period for me i think just the changing um landscape constantly i mean 
just after both of us started in recruitment, we had the 2008 credit crunch that obviously led mm. us into yeah. a very deep recession. Um, and uh, at that point, I went from being a recruiter to being promoted to Rubicon's business development manager. And I think at the time, rather naively, um, you know, it was great having that promotion. But again, you know, Lloyd and Justin knew what the business needed and it needed somebody who was prepared to go out there day in, day out. Kick and open just, the doors. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So we, we had a real little partner in crime thing going on then, didn't we, we did. Terry? I'd go in we and did. kick open the doors and then I'd bring Terry <laughs> in. And actually, funnily enough, it's almost done a bit of a role reversal now. Yeah. Terry's actually probably better than I am at opening doors. And then he brings me in to introduce yeah. to the customer. So it's, it's really, really quite um, interesting how that tides have changed in that front. I think as well, the um, UK becoming more and more talent short has mm. been tough. Yeah. Um, probably the biggest challenge because when we came out of that recession around 2012, um, and there were more and more permanent opportunities across the UK, our talent pool just mm. kept shrinking and that sh has has continued to shrink you know with an yeah. aging workforce um the baby boomers retiring more people leaving the uk mm. than there are coming to the uk brexit it, it's just all of it is leading yeah, to just... far fewer people to fill our positions in the uk and that's yeah. never going to get easier so it's something we've got to live with yeah recruitment is a brutal industry isn't it it always appears from the outside. It is, it is. But I think it's like anything, you, you pick and choose your battles. Mm -hmm. And and it, I, I think we've become far smarter at identifying the businesses that we want to work with, the areas that we want to work within, and um, and try and make our, our lives as, as easy as possible, really. And the um, transitioning to an employee-owned business has really helped shape that for us and I know we're going to go on to a bit more about that, but it's it's helped us identify the values and behaviours and the characteristics of the types of businesses that we work best with. And we're not saying that that is only employee and businesses, because obviously majority yeah, of our customers aren't, but it's still the businesses that have those um, shared values and that yeah. um, sustainable growth and um, okay. looking after their people. It's an interesting dynamic, isn't it, that having gone through the employee ownership trust process that you yeah. come out and it's shaping, you know, not just your business internally, but your business externally. Absolutely. As well. Absolutely. Um, so how let's talk about that. How did the employee ownership trust come about? You know, at the point at which Lloyd and Jostling have kind of put their hands up and say they want out, they're gonna exit, you know. Yeah. Can you remember the yeah, time yeah, and yeah. the days? Was it a shock? How did it feel? I was just going to say, it might be worth mentioning, um, Lloyd and Jocelyn, actually, um, in June 2012, called Terry and myself to a meeting, a lunch at Hotel okay. Devan. I can remember it so clearly, um, to gift us shares. Yeah. So that was the first step, I suppose, of Terry and I probably knowing at that point that we were never going to leave. <laughs> You're going to be, going to be tied to yeah. Mars. We're in it yeah. For the long run. yeah. So, so that at that point, um, we were made directors. Bearing in mind, you know, we were yeah, twenty-seven, um, yeah. and then it didn't. It it did mean it meant everything, but it meant nothing at the mm. same time. Um, because we already were treating the business like it was our own anyway, and hence yeah. why why they did they what gave they did. us. Yeah gifted us the shares but it probably really didn't mean anything to us um more than you know the, yeah. the title and the responsibility until we started or they started considering what their exit yeah. options might look like and at first um it, you know no secret they they considered a trade sale mm, yeah. um but after going through the motions with that and coming quite close um, it was decided that that wasn't the best yeah. thing for Rubicon and more importantly, the people at Within Rubicon. Yeah. 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 So in October 2020, after obviously really 
um, challenging year, um, Lloyd was introduced to the concept of employee ownership. And at that point, there were, I think, two or three a hundred percent employee owned recruitment yeah. consultancies in the UK. So it's really, really early days. Um and employee ownership since then has, you know, yeah, been on a huge growth tra yeah, trajectory. Absolutely. Um I mean there's many, many, many recruitment consultancies who are employee owned now, but at the time um we were one of the first. So And yeah. how did it feel when it was I know you were shareholders so you were sort of more party to the discussions you'd understood that there might be in a trade so yeah but I, can you imagine your can you remember your initial emotions when it was talked about that actually this is going to become employee owned and not owned by a big corporate it, it, it was incredibly exciting um, but then it's trying to communicate that message out across the wider business yeah. and and um, and the impact that it can have on those guys in the longer term um, I think being being truthful, the early days of the employee ownership, we didn't fully understand what it meant. Mm -hmm. And even though from being uh, individuals that would gain financially from, from the sale of the business, there was that element of excitement. But I don't think we fully understood the true um, opportunity that being mm. employee owned would bring. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until last year that we went to the employee ownership conference up in Liverpool, which Lloyd attended and, and Lloyd joined us. And I think that was a real eye opener for all of us. Mm, even um, for him. Yeah. So you were 18 months, two years. Two, over two years. Two so, years post yeah. doing the actual post transaction. Post doing it. And, and I, I, I think, well, personally, I went to the, to the conference almost expecting to be given a, a handbook of, here you go, here's your employee ownership journey. And what we learn, and we're now in, or Jess in particular is in with lots and lots of local networks, and everyone says the same that is employee owned. There is no rhyme or rhythm or journey. Everyone's is is different yeah. in its entirety. And, and we've, I think we found our flow now and we're- There's a saying in the uh, employee, ownership world of when you meet one employee owned business you've met one employee owned business because yeah. everybody is so every yeah. business is so different yeah um but for us the turning point was really going to that conference and finding out so much just we we really didn't know what we didn't know it's interesting because i've you know speaking to many you know quite a few employee owned businesses that that word flow comes into it a, yeah. a lot seems to sort of stagger a little bit yeah in the early months and years because there is a transition that's taken there, place ownership has flowed is. but typically yeah. in this case the lloyd and jocelyn's are still here yeah. aren't they they're, they're managing through the transition yeah 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 people absolutely. don't know how to be behave people don't know what difference it's made and it's it must have feel really weird both from their perspective as former owners but yeah as senior people in the business it must feel strange as to what has or hasn't happened yeah it, it, yeah it's it, it's finding your your boundaries and yeah. the sort of parameters that you operate within but then beyond the leadership as well it's it's things like instating an employee council and yeah. it's giving those guys a voice and then it's trying to cascade down through the business to everyone that you have a voice you can mm -hmm. give input and we we're, we're really lucky in the way that rubicon's always been a business that kind of fixates on gaining input from individuals yeah. but historically the the decision would lie with the leadership team yeah. whereas there are certain things now that we're, we're taking we're identifying okay this is something that we want to look at we don't care what the outcome is yeah if this Go affects council and we'll let them yeah. talk things yeah. through Cause and cause the decision that that's they that's a big transition isn't yeah. it it's, yeah yeah I mean, it was brilliant very entrepreneurial but it's probably yeah. quite forthright and and the buck and decisive. stops. Yeah. And he, the buck stopped there, so he'd be decisive. And yeah. he'd probably, he'd really good on the engagement piece, but he'd get everybody engaged and off you went. But yeah. now you've got, you've had to move to this more collective decision mm. yeah. making. If it, if it affects 35 odd people, mm. then especially in an employee owned business, really that, um, you know, the, the, the thought process, the decision needs to include more people than perhaps just the two yeah. people or the leadership team or whoever's running the business. Mm. Um, 
So just, you know, a, a few examples. I mean, we've looked at our dress code recently, um, post pandemic, yeah. perhaps, you know, our mm. dress code that was written or dress code policy that was written 15 odd years ago was a little bit archaic. Yeah. Didn't suit the, modern the demographic yeah. of our business. But equally, post-pandemic, maybe a few things had crept in that certainly were a far cry from the original yeah. policy. <laughs> so yeah. it's, you know, but actually Terry and I sitting there thinking, gosh, like, do we really want to be spending our time working out a dress code policy, okay. which we don't know how on board the rest of the business is going to be on it and what views they might have, how strongly they might feel about yeah. certain yeah. things. I know. Let's push this out to the council and they yeah. can solicit feedback from the rest of the business. And come back, set the policy. And exactly. Yeah. exactly. A very quick break from this week's episode, which I hope you're enjoying. If you are enjoying, please remember, do help us and help yourself to make sure you don't miss an episode by subscribing and reviewing the episode. So that's it. Short interlude from me. Let's get back to the conversation. Obviously, both of you have been in a business for 20 years that had that forthright, mm -hmm. that energy. How's that impacted on your leadership style, do you think? Or do you think being employee owned is now having more of an impact on your leadership style? No, I, I, I think Lloyd has absolutely, Lloyd in particular has, has kind of set the tone. And what, what we've both learned from Lloyd is, is absolutely you know, it, it monstrous. Yeah. We, are, we are mini Lloyds in, in, yeah. in sort of many ways. Um, and I think looking at the soft skills that we've taken, the time management, the communication, the it, it, just dealing with people on a day-to-day -day basis and the understanding of what the inputs have to be in order to get the desired output. We've, we've taken all of that. What we've then tried to ensure that we're doing is taking all the positives, but bringing others along for the journey as well. And I think if you look at the, the leadership team in particular, so Lloyd was always heavily involved in, in marketing. JB, Jocelyn was heavily involved in the finance we we didn't have a, a good understanding of finance or or marketing so as we've needed to to step up and to get a grasp on what we need to be doing and what we're now accountable and responsible for within those remits we've needed others within the business to step yeah. up accordingly but when when you are initially stepping up you don't understand the full impact that it's going to have on your old job mm -hmm. and then how to fill that old job so so we we've leaned on the employee ownership side to get people more empowered and to encourage people to take ownership of areas that maybe they wouldn't ordinarily have done so which has then freed us up to to step up into to, to voids that have been yeah. created yeah one of the um examples is that we are just implementing a new crm okay biggest project um certainly from a system yeah. side in yeah. 13 years. Yeah. And one of our team who started with us January 2020, so she's been with us nearly five years, as an operator, consultant, expressed a desire to um, change her role, but very yeah. much wanted to stay with the business. And she kind of proposed her own role, didn't she? And actually what, what's happened since is she is leading the implementation. Okay. Um, had Jocelyn been in the business, yep. that would have been led by Jocelyn. And mm. undoubtedly, this colleague of ours would have had, um, you know, an opportunity to learn. But actually, we've had no choice but to really entrust her. And she's just done an yeah. absolutely remarkable job. So I think one of the things it's taught me is people are good like people have got a lot of skills even if yeah. they don't have loads of experience mm. um you know just the amount of time that people spend doing things doesn't necessarily define their capability no. and so even sometimes in your business you've got inexperienced people but they've got the the raw competencies and talent and aptitude to do certain things and you let them loose and you trust them give them the right tools then they can really, you know, do remarkable things. And I think that's been one of the most satisfying things for us this year. Yeah. And do you think 
you would have done that anyway as leaders. Do you think that's your leadership style or do you think the employer ownership trust makes that happen? Definitely employee yeah. ownership has plays a part in it because it is about the voice of other people. Yeah, so if somebody speaks up and puts their hand up... I was going to say, do you think people put their hand up more because they feel it's employee only? Yeah, one of our main objectives for the last six months, Q3 and Q4 of this year, has been collaboration. And we've always been... Um, we Rubicon's always been about working together. And we're even individuals within the company, they don't have their own individual targets. It's team-based targets. So recruiters work together to achieve a common goal. Um, but we've pressed on that even more over the last sort of six months. Mm. And the results that we're seeing are, are, are fantastic. And it's because I think everyone understands that this is our collective goal. This is your part of that, but mm. this is our collective goal. So if you can help the other team get there a little bit quicker, it's it's going to help us all yeah. in the in the long run. And again, the the more we 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 mentioned loosely the sort of dress code earlier, that that's a minor thing in comparison to some of the other projects that we've mm. given the guys to look at. The more autonomy that they're given with regards to making these decisions, the more they're talking, the more they're getting involved, the more they're wanting to to um to be involved because it's it's ultimately down to down to them and we've made a couple of mistakes with regards to the sort of employee council and 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 how that works but six months later on we now know how to support them to support the wider company and that's where it's very different when you're the leadership team with a council because you're you're helping them to help themselves to help others <laughs> Didn't yeah. articulate that too well, but you get the yeah, gist. Yeah, I get it's, the gist. It's, it's, it uh, does add, they need some direction. It adds this kind of dynamic to it, yeah, doesn't it? It doesn't yeah, exist yeah. in a normal Absolutely. business. And it's just that, yeah, yeah. other sounding board. So we talk about it sometimes takes a while for an employee-owned only business to get in its flow and to make that yeah. transition and perhaps for the team to feel like, actually, we're not owned by two individuals anymore. We're part of the ownership vehicle. Yeah. If you were, if I was thinking of taking a role to an employee ownership place what lessons in hindsight and what hints and tips would you give me Jess you have to go out there and seek to gain knowledge from businesses who've done it before yeah I think that's perhaps initially in the first two years where we were naive and we didn't proactively go out there to speak to founders who've gone through the transition, employees who've been part of employee-owned businesses for years, MDs who, like us, have come into their role as MD since the business has transitioned and the founders have exited. It's all of that. It's that knowledge share. Um, and there's a couple of um, businesses, our friends locally, Salad, they do a lot of knowledge share Um uh, events um mm. just had their third one recently and it's from those sorts of um meetups where you mm. you get so much so much from those because you're on this journey together yeah. aren't you? you've all gone through these experiences and it's that benefit of the peer environment again absolutely from others. Yeah. yeah and terry any hints and tips that you'd have i think just building on what what jess said i mean you you just made reference to we're all on this journey we are, but every EO's journey is yeah. so incredibly different. So, and I think it depends on where you start from. And we were really lucky in the way that at Rubicon, we've always had a really strong culture and we've always been fixated on the people within the business. So we, we were coming from a, a, a pretty strong starting place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, building on, on what Jess says, it's, it's, there's, there's not one rule that fits all it's completely the opposite but providing you understand the end objective i suppose with the employee ownership um, model then you can't go far wrong yeah and what is the end objective oh because there is some criticism of employee ownership trust that the really yeah. they're the only an exit mechanism for low taxes for the previous owners i mean that yeah, that yeah. is abandoned yeah. out there a lot if you google employee ownership trust that's what you'll see yeah you know but you know how do you see them i think it's um having 
been here for nearly 20 years and it feeling like five, I can probably see the end, um, the, the, the finishing line a little bit more than some of the others. But we're, we're an incredibly profitable business when we reach our financial freedom day. So yeah. this is the point at which the founders are cleared of, yeah. of any out, uh, outstanding balances. The money that's then within this business is, is vast. And when we get to that point and when we've nailed the council and when the employees as a whole are 100% confident in their voice, that, that's the end objective. It's, it's, it's trying to paint a picture that demonstrates where we will be. Maybe not yeah. where we are right now, but where we will be. Um, so we've got a giant board downstairs with a huge okay. arrow on it that highlights where we are on the journey. Um, something yeah. else we picked up from Lloyd and JB was the transparency yeah. with regards to the financial side of the business. And this is something that, that we're, we're continuing on with. And it's to ensure that individuals know where we are and how yeah. close we are and the progress we're making. Well, that's evolved actually, because um, as well as being really transparent, which as an employee owned business, we, we should be, we already were, we need to continue that journey. But um, one of the objectives again this year has been to equip our managers to better understand profit and loss, yeah. balance mm. sheets, cash flow, keep them in the loop about so they debtors. So behave more and like owners. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And that's actually, you know, if you ask any of them, which we regularly do what they, you know, what they've really enjoyed over the last few months, it has been becoming more financially astute. Yeah. And that's with our head of finance, you know, she's been doing yeah. lunch, at Louise lunches, you know, where she's just going through um, you know, how to read a profit and loss and just making it really easy for them to mm. understand. Yeah. Um, so that's been good. But, you know, to be able to, having both been here for such a long time, we've seen a lot of our people, um, you know, with sort of eight, 10 years tenure here, which is amazing. Some of our managers have been here 10 years, which is, mm. is fantastic. We've watched them, you know, go off, have babies, come back, buy houses, get married, all of those lovely things. Yeah. Um, but then seeing that next change in their lives where they're the shared prosperity um, yeah. so that, you know, in an owner managed business it's a it's a different goal than in an yeah. employee owned business we will get to essentially share the wealth yeah. and that you know is is it really just takes exciting. time to get there and that's the it same does. as if you've done a management buyout exactly mm -hmm. is that there is that there would have been bank yeah, debt yeah, you just absolutely. you know you've got two founders that are being paid off over a period of time i yeah. love this fact about financial freedom day and that you're yeah. really open about it and i suppose that must aid retention because people see, well, that's what we're working towards and post that date. Yeah, Collectively, we I think we've got 100 and, 192 years of, of um, service within Rubicon, not years of recruitment within experience, but yeah. years of service within Rubicon, which is massive. Yeah. And I, that, that's, a, that's a lot. And, um, and that's something that we're really, really proud of. But where we've now got lots of individuals that have been here from five to, to 10 years, they are looking at, the next step and actually you know yeah. four years five years to that financial freedom day it's not it's not quite as far as if you had just finished your a levels and yeah we're sort of fresh out of college yeah and we hope the younger generation the people joining us now will get to that point as well because we appreciate that looking ahead four years time as terry says you know when you're 21 22 yeah. like or like we were when we first started you know we wouldn't have seen ourselves here in four years time, but actually it's going to be worth it. Yeah, it, it really is. Yeah, it is absolutely. going to be worth it. And we're talking to, you know, the grandfathers of the employee own, uh, employee ownership world and, and knowing that they're able to share those profits mm. with the people as well as obviously invest back into the business, because that's something that we will really want to focus yeah. on when we've got yeah. more money available yeah. and i suppose that does that must be one of the benefits of being employee owned is that actually to a certain degree there is more incentive to reinvest back in to the future isn't there, mm. there, there whereas there when, is, when yeah. you are entrepreneurial or owner managed at points in time that money has has to come out because there's an, another need or demand absolutely mm. well we've absolutely. got big plans and we need 
we need to invest. So yeah, the next few okay. years and, you know, even this year so far, I mean, the amount that we've grown outside of Dorset because mm. that, you know, we've, Rubicon's got such a strong brand. I've been going since 1982 in Dorset. Mm. You know, everybody knows Rubicon. Yeah. Um, but we're not a little parochial high street recruitment consultancy anymore. We've got clients um, in like all over the north. We've got a huge client base in Cambridgeshire, Kent. I mean, we've monopolized this little area in Kent and it's just phenomenal where everyone talks to everyone and suddenly yeah. we've got, you know, this this really lovely spread of clients there. Um, Sussex, Wiltshire, Somerset, um, you know, pockets of London. So that's yeah. really, really exciting. So it's that mm. growth and we need to, um, yeah, we need to invest to keep that going. Brilliant. And what are, so I think that starts to answer a question about what are your ambitions uh, as yeah. joint managing directors? You know, where would you want to see the business in 10 years time? That's a, it, 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 it's, um, you'll be both nearly 50 at that point. I know. Thanks, years old Warren. As yeah. <laughs> We're not 40 yet. Yeah. Come on, hold on. <laughs> not far off, not far off. Um, I, it, it'll be, so we're, Moving into to next year already, we're, we're um, working through with the individuals across the business what, what their ambitions are and what they're hoping to achieve over the next 12 months. So we're, we're really big on this at the moment. And I think our, our collective ambition would be to, to ensure that we're operating across multiple markets so we're not beholden to one. Yeah. So we're, we're sort of fairly uh, recession proof considering the way the world is at the moment, but equally that we're building on pockets that enable individuals to fuel their own growth. Yeah. So like, for example, there's a young lady called Grace that was in uh, Australia for how long? Um, Grace was there for two years and came back to us. So she was employed with Rubicom. From yeah. 2014 for a few years and went over to Australia for two years and came back recently. She set up in the north. So she's a little mini Rubicon up in the north now, which mm -hmm. is fantastic. And looking at tapping into the employee ownership network and keeping in mind what we were saying earlier about many of these businesses have shared values and similar cultures. They're, they're, they're fairly easy to work with. She's a well-positioned little island that enables mm -hmm. us to tap into some of the other the other businesses up in that part of the world okay. so we'd also like to see um you know our people um aspire to the goals that they have so you know perhaps more you know people joining the leadership team um and growth within their roles like terry and um i and joe joe west um yeah. had the opportunity mm. to um, do so. Um, we want to make sure that there's succession and people are able to fulfil what their ambitions are. Um, yeah, and just, I mean, keep living our purpose, really, improving people's working lives. All right, look at that. It's <laughs> great, isn't it? And what do you see as some of the challenges facing the, forget the Rubicon piece and the business piece, it sounds like you've got quite mm. that sorted. You've got a very clear definition of what Rubicon is after a transitional period what the employee ownership trust means yeah. for it. I think anybody listening will see that the two of you clearly in the way in which you just interact with each other are a strong management team, but that's all great. That's the internal stuff. Mm -hmm. There's got to be some challenges and turmoil for the recruitment sector generally, hasn't there, in the years ahead. How do you see those challenges? What are they and how are you planning to head them off, I suppose? I think... So putting on my, my old hat, which was technical, um, it's, it's very much the continued skill shortage. And it's, it's working out where and the type of industries that we want to work within, um, where we can compete. It's, it's, it's engineering, manufacturing, even locally, there's, there's significant shortages of the skills that companies need. Um, so... I think the biggest challenge that we have is identifying the sectors that we want to be invested in, the the sectors that we want to, to invest more in, and that then comes down to geographical location. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's it, it's all about the skills from my perspective. How do you cover the skills shortage? And for mm. you, Jess? I think the 
the cost to deliver um pre the pandemic it was averaging about 30 days to fill a permanent vacancy that's now increased to 41 working days 41 yeah. working days is over eight weeks mm. um and i think you know it's still really competitive out there most businesses want to push for a lower fee mm. um and that's not really the market we're competing in um so it's but it's it's really actually delivering the service that we want to deliver with the rising costs of linkedin i mean mm. we have to have linkedin recruiter because you won't find the candidates you mm. want from relying mm. on traditional advertising and the cost of linkedin recruiter because it's the only sort of you know um headhunting well the most well known and well widely used headhunting tool is extortionate and these businesses have got the monopoly so they can yeah. you know really charge higher prices i think yeah. our job board costs have tripled in price this year wow they um, really are monopolizing yeah, the market and so, taking the margin aren't yeah they? yeah yeah, I've I've had a few um few employers falling out with certain job boards right. over recent months. Um so yeah, if you're having problems then <laughs> we've still got good relationships with those job boards. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, I think yeah, it's that so cost, cost to, to serve. cost to serve, yeah, cost to deliver um is is challenging. Mm, it is interesting, isn't it? Indeed. Um so, should we go to some quick fire questions? Okay. Here we go. So, you're going to have to look at each other and decide who's going to answer which one. We're both going to answer, but in which order. Right. Okay. If you could have any superpower to help you as a new MD, what would it be and why? I think the ability to read people's minds, it make man management a lot easier. <laughs> and negotiating. I love that yeah. answer. Yeah. That's a really good answer, Terry. Terry's more creative than me. Um, I think more... <laughs> more time to slow down and actually be able to mentor and coach people right. more the ability to slow um, down time yeah yeah and the ability to read minds they'd be both two great that, superpowers yeah, isn't it? Yeah. um what's the most memorable or funniest moment that the two of you have shared in your 20 years together at rubicon shared i send you through your memory banks now because there must have been some hilarious moments. There, there have been. Well, we recently did. I mean, and this is very recent. There's going to be some in the, in the archives. But we Not recently all of them did probably the repeatable. Yeah, <laughs> we it. we did the mud run recently, and that that was that was good fun. There was a yeah. there was a, a team building event, and um, we did the uh, water park and the mud run, and. Needless to say, the mud run didn't get as many um, as much interest as we we had hoped, but it <laughs> it, it, it was good fun. Oh, it's a bit of a rubbish one though. Come on, Terry. I think what? one, um, and this was when there was massive uh, migration from Eastern European workers to to Dorset in particular. So this was this was when you would have ten individuals per job, you know, a, a very far from where we are today, and um, and we were having far too many people come through and register. And it was taking up a lot of time. So I stuck an advert out the front or a big board saying uh, no registrations, only polishers. Because we were looking <laughs> for polishers at the time. So words soon spread around the Polish community. And we had every single Polish person in Dorset <laughs> queuing at Rubicon applying for the polishing job. Which um, I think that was, that, was, that was one that backfired. I should have thought about that. Brilliant. Fantastic. As... New leaders, what keeps you awake at night? What's the one thing at the moment that's troubling you? Gosh, I think it's, it's, it's the market's been so uncertain, um, especially in the permanent recruitment space. It's been so uncertain. Like March, April this year, you know, it was widely known across the UK that there was a massive decline in permanent opportunities. And where it's quite a... Um, you know, it's, it, it can be quite a transactional business, that permanent recruitment mm. market. You don't know exactly when your customers are going to be recruiting. You work in partnership with them and 
hope you know they're going to sort of keep you in the loop with what their recruitment strategy is looking like for the next year. You just can't guarantee it. It's it's that guaranteeing it piece. So as we go into our Q4, the final quarter of a fantastic year, you still mm. get these butterflies in your tummy yeah. and think, oh gosh, please let it, please let it be good. Yeah. Um, and and we know that. You know, as long as we are talking to all of our customers regularly, we're providing them the service, um, we're getting out there, we're meeting new prospects and things, we know that it, it will be okay. But um, yeah, it's probably that. Market conditions, mm. okay. And what keeps you awake, Terry? I think it's um, it's whether, it, it's, it's the wider company's dependence on us with regards to direction. And, and before, and I think this is the most challenging part of being a leader, it's, or one of the most difficult, it's, it's, it's the responsibility. It's that if you've made the wrong decision, it's not just you that's going to, going to, to feel that, it's the entire business. And I think we've, we've put a lot of time and effort into thinking and planning out the direction we're going in. But I think, I think that's it. It's, you can yeah. see that he's internal and I'm yeah, external. <laughs> Can see that. Yeah. It's interesting though, yeah. but that's another great example of the complementary and yeah. why it's going to work and why it is working and all those things. But you're right, aren't you? Is that the business has had quite a visionary leader in, it has. in Lloyd. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm. And it's okay saying we'll set decisions and we'll let the employee committee council make decisions, but it's the two of you ultimately in the years ahead that absolutely. have got to go, this is who we are, this yeah. is where we're going, this is our yeah vision and yeah. then take them on that journey and that's a different place for both of you isn't it definitely it is. definitely it's yeah it's we're employee owned but we are still leadership led we yeah. can't yeah. you know be you a complete democracy no. that'd just be carnage <laughs> <laughs> it would be it would. right so I'm gonna get you to describe each other as leaders in three words you're allowed three words each to describe the other as leaders how you look like you're ready to go, Terry. So I'm going to let Jess off at first and go, you can go first. Describe Jess as a leader in three words. Okay. Confident, knowledgeable, and has the memory of an elephant. <laughs> the, the way she was pulling dates off earlier, she'll remember what your kid had for their fourth birthday party okay. 17 years ago. She, the memory is... Outstanding memory. Okay, cool. Can do it in reverse then, Jess. Thoughtful, extremely organised, and good planner. Thoughtful, I know that's more organised. Then we'll go thoughtful, organised. There you are. Okay. Um, and playful. Oh, cool. I like that word. Keeps things fun. Right. Got to have fun in life. Hundred percent. Yeah, I think the team would disagree, but yeah. No. <laughs> they got me back the other day. So. Um, and therefore, comes to the end of the conversation. It's been a great conversation. I always end the podcast with this kind of question about your own personal definition of success. So I'm going to ask you both that question. Who wants to go first? Well, definitely happiness. Um, and knowing that you've put in, you know, everything that you've got to achieve the outcome that you want, but whilst making sure that you are, you know, happy, happy along the way and enjoy the ride. Brilliant. Thank you. That's great. Terry. I think mine was similar to that. I think you, you just made my life slightly more difficult there. Thanks. But it, it, it's, um, I, you I think success there. means different things to different people. Oh, absolutely. And so I, I would, or success to me is achieving the goals that I have set and not letting anything stand in that in in the way of that. So for for others that might be just finding a lovely job and a happy family and it, it, yeah, I, it, achieving the targets, the objectives that you set yourself. Brilliant. So obviously great conversation. Yeah. Loads in there guys around the employee ownership trust piece, your shared leadership, some of your story and history, I'm sure which will really resonate with our listeners. If they want to know more yeah. about Rubicon, then get or want in to make connect, with Jess. <laughs> get yeah. in touch with Jess. <laughs> if they want to connect with you, how can they do that? Um yeah, LinkedIn, uh, Jess Comley Jones, Terry Porter. 
probably use it a little bit more than Terry. Yeah, but um, also there's but, all the events, the yeah, HR forum. We've got our HR forum, yes. Recruitment and retention workshop that you're we running. Do workshops. So. We've got recruitment and retention workshop on this week. We're running another one in early November. Yeah, um, yeah lots of ways. But yeah, follow uh, Rubicon People Partnership on LinkedIn. Um, and we, yeah, look, hopefully look forward to joining us on a workshop of some kind. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you for both being great guests on the Lovely. Evolve to Succeed podcast. Thanks Thank for you. having us. So I promised you a great and informative conversation at the start in the intro, and I think we've definitely had that. Some insights for us all there around that whole employee ownership trust piece, which is becoming more and more popular. How they're making the leadership work between them as joint and managing directors. I loved the bit and the conversation about when they were really reflecting on Lloyd and Jocelyn and the impact they've had and how they're taking some of the lessons from their styles into their own styles and so much more. So I hope you've really enjoyed that episode. And if so, do rate and subscribe the podcast for us, please. And please join us in two weeks time for the next episode of the Evolve to Succeed podcast. Thank you.